Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. As you can see, our sanctuary is beautifully adorned with 42 banners of young men and women who will be confirmed next Sunday at the 1030 service. Now, you're probably the 8 o'clock crowd if you're sitting here right now, but uh, think how long it's going to take to read those 42 names and think of all the parents and grandparents who will be here. So that's my polite way of suggesting if you uh, think about worshiping at 1030 next Sunday, maybe consider an alternate service time uh, so that we can... Uh, Keep that open for the families that for confirmation. If you do come, though, I'm sure you'll help them sing. Uh, next Sunday is also our Reformation celebration. Just a reminder, uh, Red will be on the altar, a uh, festive day of that year. Please stand, greet one another, though, and we're glad to have you worship with us today.
This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. So we pray, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. This morning's Old Testament comes to us from the book of Ecclesiastes. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also his vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun, Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord.
shall the young cleanse their way by keeping to your words. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commandments. I treasure your promise in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Instruct me in your statutes. With my lips will I recite all the judgments of taking greater delight in the way of your decrees than in all manner of riches. I will meditate on attention to your ways. My delight is in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Our epistle reading comes to us from the book of Hebrews. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we have believed enter that rest, as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today if you hear this voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of a spirit, of joints and of marrow, and concerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help him in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand. A gospel reading from Mark chapter 10. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, 
With man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's so wonderful to see you here coming to worship Jesus and to hear from his word. Let's review from a couple weeks ago. We talked about a special name that God gives us. So let's read this together. It says, I'm a child of God. Can you read that with me? Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. Let's try it again. Can you say it with me? I'm a child of God. Absolutely. Yes, we are all children of God. Now, that was a little bit silly, but that does remind me that sometimes Jesus turns things upside down from what we normally think. Now, we are children of God, and so we hear messages from God because our true home is with Jesus. 
And we also, right now, hear messages from the world because we also live in the world. So boys and girls, Jesus said something a little bit funny in the reading today. He said that the last shall be first. Now, the world tells us that the first are first and the last are last. But Jesus turns that upside down. Here's how I need your help today. Whenever I go like this, I need you to say, flip. Can you try it? Flip. Oh, great job. So Jesus turns this upside down. Flip. Jesus says, the last are first and the first are last. That's a little bit different than we normally think about it. Let's find out some other things Jesus turns upside down. The world tells us that you are great if others serve you. But Jesus says this is a little bit different. He turns this upside down too. Flip. Jesus says, you are great when you serve others. The world tells us that we'll be really, really happy if we get lots of things or have a big house or have lots of toys or money. We should get, get, get all we want. But Jesus turns that upside down. Flip. Jesus says we should give to others. The world tells us that we should hate our enemies and we should be mean to the people who are mean to us. But guess what? Jesus turns us upside down. Flip. Jesus says we should love our enemies and we should pray for those who are mean to us. Now Jesus knows that it's sometimes hard to do these things that Jesus calls us to do. Jesus lived on earth, so he knew what it was like to hear messages from the world and messages from God. And so he knows it's hard, but he tells us that with him, anything that seems impossible, he can turn that upside down too. Flip! And he can turn it into possible. Let me show you one more thing that Jesus turns upside down. The world tells us that everything has a beginning and an ending. They all go through lifetimes and eventually all things die. Flowers do, plants do, and people do too. But Jesus loves us so much, he came and lived on the earth. He died for us, and you know he rose again. And so Jesus turns death upside down too. Flip! Do you know what he turns it into? Life. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we know that we have life with him and will live with him forever in heaven. Praise God that he turns all these things upside down. He turns the impossible to possible. He turns our sadness to dancing and our death into life. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for turning things upside down. Help us always praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the picture that comes to my mind. To fill it out, I had to keep reading a bit. So I'd like 
you to imagine holding this picture, or pictures as well. In the first image, well, the first image might as well be black and white because the scene is so dark that you'd not be able to tell otherwise anyhow. And that first image is a man at table. But the barely touched food in front of him has grown cold. Though you can't touch, you can tell. The candle lighting his table like the fire in his hearth has burned out. Not just to embers, to ash. And it's like he doesn't notice. Didn't heed at all the sun going down. Barely recognizes that he's in a dark room, a place of darkness at all. He's sick, but not with a diagnosable disease. He's sick in the way that you can only be when your daily dish is regret mixed with resentment, and your constant companions are one day guilt, the other anger. Alone with all that, he sits. Sometimes, even in a still, you can see turmoil, a never resting lack, not of food, not of shelter, but of peace. And in contrast to that shadowy darkness is the second picture. A picture that's full of color and vibrancy and life. There's nothing opulent about it, but a group of people whose care for one another is moving, even when you capture it in a moment. The baskets of simple food before them are for sharing, and smiles come as freely as the drinks flow. The place they sit is no palace. There's no finery on the table, but the whole of it, it's warm and good. You can feel it emanating, pushing the chill from your bones. It's like walking back toward the fire when you've gotten cold. Like walking back into the circle where there's life and chatter and warmth. If at first you'd only consider the two pictures side by side like you could back when pictures were printed and held in the hand, not swiped, Maybe you'd think that the difference is simply that in one, a person is alone, and in the other, there's community. That, I think, is part of it, but it's not all of it. Here's why. The book of Ecclesiastes is a personal favorite of mine. Ecclesiastes is challenging, it's poetic, and it's the kind of thing you could read every year, and certainly you'd understand a little more as you go, but you'd never wrap your hands fully around it. Ecclesiastes is part of the Old Testament's wisdom tradition with books like Job or Song of Solomon. But most importantly for today's conversation is how Ecclesiastes relates to a book like Proverbs, the most famous of all Old Testament wisdom books. You see, in some ways, Ecclesiastes is the response to questions that might come up when you live Proverbs the way you're supposed to. Here's what I mean. The dude in picture one, if you remember his backstory from the text, he has things that the book of Proverbs name as blessings. He has children. Specifically, we hear about a son. And Proverbs tells us that's a good thing. Proverbs can guide our parenting, can guide our thankfulness. And the man, what he seeks is something that Proverbs likewise thinks is good. He seeks to create a financial legacy for his family. Proverbs says that's a blessing when we can do that. But for this man, in our text for today, something went wrong. I don't know if he was a touch too risky, but the deal falls through. The business fails. And he no longer has anything to give. His shame about it, his anger over it, leaves him a lonely mess. It doesn't say here that the son abandoned him, just more like he couldn't face people anymore. See, the book of Ecclesiastes steps in and says stuff like this. When you try to do what's right, when you try to live according to God's desire for you, oftentimes things go pretty well. But here's the thing. Not always. For all we know, the story that's told here is one of righteous behavior. Thankful for what God had given, both in wealth and family. The intention to bless the future. And suddenly it all fails. 
He had attempted to live the words and wisdom of a book like Proverbs, but was disappointed with how it all turned out. And in his anger, he hid himself away with only the grudge to keep him company. In the other picture, we see a different kind of proverbial wisdom. That work, that work is good. That friendship also is good. The laborer makes less, sure. Isn't creating a legacy gift, but just getting by, sure. And yet the happiness and friendship of picture two, it's clear. In the picture we saw, what the text described as someone or someones being, quote, occupied by joy. And if you wonder what the difference is between the two, Sure, you can find differences, place, people, all that. But the real difference is that the one in darkness is filled with discontentment, occupied only by what is lost, what is gone, and what is missing. In the bright and warm picture, there is contentment, occupied by what is there, who is there, and the moment that we have to share it. Contentment. I read a little further on in Ecclesiastes to get a fuller picture. It becomes clearer even as we read. This is how Ecclesiastes says it. I know folks who had so much, who had the riches of the world, who had all the family you could ask for in the world. But if you, Ecclesiastes says, are not satisfied, then you might end up with no one to even attend your funeral. You see, the first man in darkness, it seems that maybe he could have opened his hand over and over again to give or to celebrate. But he became so consumed with what could be. When that shatters, if he had the courage to apologize to his son for having nothing to give, well, he might have heard back but all I ever wanted was you. So community, yes. To be thankful for family, for friends. But also contentment. A thankfulness for the work, even if it doesn't yield much. Especially if you have someone working along by your side, you're twice blessed then. And an acknowledgement that sometimes life goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. But inside, both of those and all the way in between, there are blessings abundant. So ancient and lofty wisdom, what does it have to say to us today? First, that the opening of this text is important for any, for all. That he who loves money will not be satisfied with it. If you have a bunch, you're best off being thankful for what you have. And it's still true if you have less than a bunch. To be thankful also for the work that you're given and whatever comes of it. To think about tomorrow, but not at the absolute expense of today. To be thankful for the people that God has placed in your life and to let them know that you're thankful for them. Not that they're just extra mouths to feed or extra responsibility, but they're a gift from God. And if that kind of satisfaction following contentment is elusive to you, hear the last verse of our reading for today about the one who labors. He is occupied with joy, won't even remember the fleetingness of life. Here's a subtly different way to think about it. Contentment in this life, it's part thankfulness, a willingness to be satisfied with whatever we get from God's hand. But it's also part knowing that this life is not all there is. That our greatest legacy won't be an inheritance of money given, but a legacy of faith passed on. A faith that says there's a future with hope where the table of God will be full and the richness of his presence will be for all. Let your contentment be found in this. Our Father desiring a future for us, did not withhold his riches, but instead he gave lavishly, he gave Jesus. 
Because you see, sometimes we think our biggest need is our most recent desire. But that's not so. Our biggest need is a relationship with our God and Father. And that is restored, not through our investment, not through our savvy, but by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, who enters our lonely darkness and brings us into the light, where suddenly simple gifts are treasures when we know whose hand we receive them from and can share them with the people of God. Jesus, who is God with us, and also the one who can take all that anger and resentment, and he can treat it, not by showing us the way to vengeance, but by showing us the way of forgiveness. Because when we believe, as we should, that our future is guaranteed, then this life transforms from everything to much less. And when we get straight what this life is, it can be bearable. It can even be enjoyable. When our love is of God and others, and our thankfulness is toward the simplicity of gifts given and the lavishness of forgiveness given, then we too can be occupied, not with loss, but with heaven and today's joy. Amen. Please stand.
We stand. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For Bev and Terry and Gary, for Joy, Jamie, Kyle and George, for Rick and Bruce and Emariah and those we name in our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the unborn, that their mothers would be nurtured and supported as they bear new life, and that each new life begun in the mystery of the womb would also be born again of water and spirit in this world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O oh God, in your divine wisdom, your divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all things hurtful, and give us those things that are beneficial. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you.